So welcome to all who are joining us. Um, let's see. So yeah, now we're streaming on YouTube as well. So welcome to all. All right. And then. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time of Bible study that you have allowed us to have during the season of Lent. Father God, uh, we're almost coming to a close of this Lenten season, and next week is Passion Week. Please help us to keep this season well. Help us to truly be able to come to you with prayer. May it be a time of repentance and renewal. And may we truly be able to follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that at the end of this Lenten season, as we come upon Resurrection Lord's Day, may all of our souls be renewed and resurrected with our Lord Jesus Christ. So that we may recover the image of Christ in us, Lord. Father God, at this time, we pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us and that you yourself will directly teach us your word so that these words may, be, may give us life and true faith and fill our hearts with your grace. May we be filled with your spirit so that we could walk with you day by day. Um, as we focus on the word that you give to us, may all of our prayer needs that we have in our hearts be delivered up to the throne of grace and be answered. And I pray that... Um, through this word today, that you will touch us and comfort us and give us true knowledge and faith so that we can live according to this word in our daily lives. We thank you so much for everything, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so thank you once again for joining us. Today is the last day of this uh, series of Bible studies, our Lent on the, yeah, our Lent uh, seasonal Bible study. So we're going to continue from last week um, and study about the 10 plagues and the time of his visitation. This is part two. Okay. So... Last week, we learned about plagues numbers one through six. Okay. And we learned that um, all of these plagues have spiritual meanings, right? So like frog, gnats, and flies all signify unclean spirits or deceiving spirits. Uh, or spirits of demons uh, that could deceive human beings to go against God, right? And then after the sixth plague, so we learned that these six plagues, the first six plagues were basically a warning from God. Because after the sixth plague, God says, um, the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay. Before this point, it was Pharaoh hardening his heart and not listening to God, not repenting before God. But after the sixth plague, God, God was the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then in Exodus chapter 9, verse 14, God says, from now on, I'm going to pour all my plagues on your heart. Okay. So basically what that means is the first six plagues were just a warning to give Pharaoh a chance to repent and submit to God. But his chance has run out. God says, okay, I've given him enough warning. So now... God is hardening his heart so that Pharaoh cannot repent and turn and be saved. So basically what that means is plagues 7 through 10 
are now judgment. There is no longer warning. Now Pharaoh will not get any chance to repent. Judgment means God is now attacking. It is God declaring a war on Pharaoh. Okay, because his chance has run out. Okay, so now when we look at these plagues, we can see that it is closely connected to Jesus Christ. For example, the Israelites were slaves. Israel was, uh, Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And they suffered for 400 years. And then at the end of that 400 years, the 10 plagues came. And then they came out in the Exodus. Well, just like that, the Old Testament ended with Malachi and 400 years passed. These are called the 400 years of darkness because there was no word, no prophecies, no prophets. God was silent. And then came Jesus Christ. That began the New Testament era, right? So after 400 years of suffering came the 10 plagues and the Exodus, 400 years of darkness and silence from God, and then came Jesus. But when Jesus came on the scene, Spiritually, the 10 plagues were already on the scene because Jesus healed many people who, were, who had demons, who had unclean spirits. These all are similar to the 10 plagues. Okay, And at this time, people who were in Goshen were protected from the plagues, right? And people who were in Christ, who were with Jesus, were also protected. So that means Jesus was the spiritual Goshen. Okay. So having that in mind, we're going to now get into tonight's study, starting with plague number seven. Plague number seven is the plague of hail. Okay. That's recorded in Exodus chapter nine, verses 13 through 35. So what is hail? Hail is like a ball of ice. It's like, it's like a rock, really hard, but it's ice, okay? So as, it, as you know, precipitation comes down, it's not snow. It's like big balls of ice that fall from the sky. If it hits you, it could possibly kill people and animals and destroy crops and trees and things like that, okay? So... The hail came down, and let's look at Exodus chapter 9, verse 14. I talked about this before, but let's look at this verse. So Exodus 9, 14 says, For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. So here in English, it says all my plagues on you. But in Hebrew, the word here for you is lev, which means heart. So literally what God is saying is, I will send all my plagues on your heart. Now think about that. Why would God say that? And how can you send hail on somebody's heart? Okay, so, you know, 3,500 years ago in Egypt, it literally actually hailed in Egypt and destroyed all the trees and the crops and killed them, even the livestock and some of the people even. But this also has a spiritual meaning that applies to us today. God is going to send all his plagues, including the plague of hail, on the hearts of people who are against God. Okay, So keep that in the back of your mind. What does that mean? Okay, and so the plague of hail was a, a plague that was sent on the heart of Pharaoh. Okay, and also where did this plague uh, take place in Egypt specifically? The place of destruction for the hail uh, was the field, it says, field. 
Okay. So let's look at, um, for example, uh, verse 19 here. Exodus chapter 9, verse 19. It says, now therefore send, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home, when the hail comes down on them, will die. So anything in the field will die. If it's brought inside to the home, they'll survive. But if it stays out in the field, that's going to die. The field is the place of destruction. Okay. So what does that mean? Why the field? So let's look at how this word field, which in Hebrew is shade. Okay. How is this word used? For example, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, on the sixth day, after God created man, what did he create? God created the beasts of the field. And then in Genesis chapter 3, 1, when the serpent came, the Bible describes the serpent as the most crafty of the beasts of the of all of all the beasts of the field. So serpent is a beast of the field, and it's the most crafty, most cunning, most deceptive animal of the beasts of the field. Okay. Also in Genesis chapter 4, 8, what happened in the field? Cain killed Abel in the field. So the field was the, the scene of the first murder in the Bible. Also in Genesis chapter 25, verse 27, this is the story about Esau and Jacob, right? And what does the Bible say? It says that Esau was a man of the field. And he liked to hunt. But who was Jacob? Jacob was a peaceful man dwelling in tents. So Jacob was not a, a man of the field. Jacob liked to stay at home inside the tent, whereas Esau liked to go out into the field. Okay. And then if you go back to Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 9, verse 19 and the following. So we read 19, everything that's in the field will die, right? And so it says, even the one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field and they died. So, in other words, what this verse is trying to say is that the field is the domain of those people. Field is the domain of people who don't fear God. Okay. And the beasts of the field are undomesticated, right? They're not livestock. They're wild. What does that mean? That means they have no master. So those, the people and beasts who dwell or are out in the field have no master above them. Whereas the tent where Jacob liked to dwell, tent literally means tabernacle, symbolizes God's temple, right? Or sanctuary. And in today's terms, it symbolizes the church. And those who dwell in the tabernacle have God as their master. So that's why the plague of the, the hail was directed at the field. And in the field where there's no master, whoever is more powerful is king. They could do whatever they want. They could kill you. And Cain killed Abel in the field. A lot of crime and sins take place out in the field. And that's where the hail came down upon. And everything in the field got destroyed. Let's look at verse 25. 
Exodus chapter 9, verse 25 here says, The hail struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. So everything in the field was destroyed by the, by the hail. Okay. Um, so what's the uh, redemptive historical meaning of the hail? Okay, so hail is God's weapon. Hail is God's weapon. He uses the hail to declare war on people and on nations. So, for example, in Joshua chapter 10, verse 11, when Joshua was fighting, God came and brought hail down upon his enemies. Okay, So it says, as they fled from before Israel, while they were at the descent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with the sword. See that? The hailstones were used as a weapon by God to destroy God's enemies. Also, let's look at Job chapter 38, verses 22 and 23. So Job 38, 22 and 23 says, Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of distress and for the day of war and battle? See that? God, it says, has a storehouse of hail reserved for the day of battle. When God comes to fight his final battle as a part of his judgment, he's going to use that hail, that's what it's saying. Okay, So God uses the hail to attack and defeat the nations of the world that are opposed to God. Okay, So if you look in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, at the final trumpet, at the seventh trumpet, this is what happened, right? Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Right. So this is after the final battle, the kingdom of Christ, uh, the kingdom of the world has now become the kingdom of Christ. Right. And if you read what happens here, it says, uh, in verse 19, and the temple of God, which is in heaven, was open, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. See, again, God used hailstorm as part of his weaponry to destroy the kingdoms of this world. Okay. And remember, it says that he brought this plague upon the heart of Pharaoh, right? So what that means is this, this is what it says in book eight of the History of Redemption series. It says that the, the heart was uh, where our emotion, and in ancient times, they thought our intellect was part of the heart as well, right? So heart controls your emotions and thoughts. That's what the ancient people believed because they didn't know about the brain yet. And so the fact that God brought his hail plague upon the heart means this. It, senior pastor said the plague of hail was poured out upon the heart, which means that Pharaoh's heart was filled with extreme pain and it deprived him of all peace of mind. And he was gripped with anxiety and fear. So ultimately his heart was filled with chaos and confusion so that he could not make any rational decisions. This is what happened. If God judges you, if you become an enemy of God, this is what happens. Okay? So that's what hail was. Number eight was the plague of locusts. What's going on here? Plague of locusts. Okay, so the Bible says after the hail came locusts in Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. 
The purpose of the plague of locusts, it says, was to humble the heart of Pharaoh before God. Okay. And in Exodus chapter 10, verse 5, it says that whatever the hail left behind, locusts would come and eat it. Locusts would eat it. Okay, so after the locusts, nothing survived. Everything was all greenery, all vegetation, all trees, all crops finished. That would mean that after the locusts would come a great famine, right? So what brought the locusts in Exodus chapter 10, verse 13? It says that an east wind brought the locusts. Here, the east wind brought the locusts, right? An east wind. This east wind is very important in the Bible. It, east wind symbolizes distress and tribulation that God sends. Okay. So, in, uh, for example, in Hosea chapter 13, verse 15, this is what God says. Though he flourishes among the reeds, an east wind will come. The wind of the Lord coming from the wilderness and his fountain will become dry and his spring will be dried up. It will plunder his treasury of precious, every precious article. East wind does this. Here, this is a metaphor for the Assyrians. It's talking about how the Assyrians will come and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. So when God sends an east wind, it brings destruction. So God brought God used the east wind to bring the locusts upon Egypt. And the locusts destroyed everything. Okay. And in verse 15, it says, they covered the earth so that the land became darkened. Right? So that the land was darkened. And they ate every plant, all the fruit trees that the hail had left. Thus, nothing green was left. Okay. Green symbolizes life, right? So there was no life in Egypt. Everything was dead. And then after that, after the, the plague was finished, Moses prayed. And what did God do? It says God shifted the wind to a very strong west wind. And he sent all the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. So God sent them away. Here, it says that the locusts were drowned in the Red Sea, right? This is a foreshadowing of what? This is a foreshadowing of how Pharaoh's army will be drowned in the Red Sea when they chased after the Israelites, right? They're going to drown in the Red, Red Sea just like the locusts. And yet, even though Pharaoh saw this, he still hardened his heart. Okay. So what's the redemptive historical lesson of the locusts? The Bible says that locusts, these locusts looked like an army or horses ready for battle. See, again, the same theme. Hail was God's weapon used in battle. Locusts were like an army ready for battle. Okay, let's look at Revelation chapter 9. Verse 7. The appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. Right? They looked like horses prepared for battle. And then verse 9, it says, They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots and of many horses rushing to battle. See that? The locusts look like horses ready for battle. Also, if you go to Joel chapter 2, verse 25. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust had, has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Here God says those locusts are his great army. Locusts are God's army sent against God's enemies. Okay. So there is this recurring theme of war and God attacking his enemies 
God's declaring war against Pharaoh and the Egyptians because he gave them many chances, but they refused. They re rejected God. They hardened their hearts. So now God is fighting against them. Okay. And these locusts, they're, uh, they had a king over them, right? In Revelation 9, 11, it says they have as king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name is in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in the Greek, he has the name Apollyon, right? So their king, the king of the locusts is Abaddon or Apollyon. Both of these words mean either destroyer or destruction. So the purpose of the locusts is to destroy. Okay. And similar to the hail, the locusts were a plague that's poured out on the heart or the soul of the human being. Okay. Not on the trees or vegetation. Back then in Egypt, yes. But for us today, the lesson that it's teaching us is that, as God said in Exodus 9.14, this is a plague poured out on the heart of human beings. That's why in Revelation chapter 9, in verse 4, it says this, the locusts, they, the locusts were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, Right? The locusts uh, in the end times don't hurt the trees or vegetation, but only the people who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. So it's, it's, it's attacking their souls. If they don't have the word of God, they are targets for the locusts. And once the locusts come, they're going to eat up everything. So there's going to be a spiritual famine. They will eat up all of the fruits of the spirit, the fruits of faith, fruits of the word. So the, you, no longer will you have any faith, no grace in you, no word in you. So there's going to be spiritual famine and spiritual darkness. And look at chapter 9, verse 6 here. After the locusts come by, what happens? In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. How scary is that? It's, the pain of the locusts will be so much in your heart, in the soul. It'll be so painful that they want to die, but they can't find death. They won't be able to die. Okay. So that's what the locust is. It's an attack on the soul of human beings so that all of the fruits of faith, the spiritual fruits and the trees and vegetation and all of spiritual life is all destroyed. Okay. And then number nine is the plague of darkness. This is in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. There was darkness throughout Egypt for three days. But in Goshen, there was light. Okay. Goshen is where the Israelites lived, right? So what does this uh, plague of darkness teach us? What is it teaching us? Well, what are some of the distinctive features of this darkness is this. It, the Bible says it was a darkness that can be felt. What does that mean? How do you feel darkness? I mean, how can it be felt? You touch it with your hands? Well, I mean, a lot of people think it's like that kind of a literary device saying that oh, it was so dark that you could feel the darkness. But I think it has a deeper meaning than that. Okay. So it's a darkness. Again, these plagues are all poured out upon the heart, right? It's a darkness that is felt in your heart. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 29. It says, and you will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness, and you will not prosper in your ways, but you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually with none to save you. So if God is against you, this is what happens. You're going to be groping in darkness like a blind man, right? Like this, trying to feel your way in darkness. Okay. And in Exodus chapter 10, verse 23, it says that, 
They couldn't see each other. And not only that, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. So for three days, the Egyptians could not even get up because it was so dark. But does that even make sense? I mean, you could kind of get around by feeling, right? Or try to light a match or like a lamp or whatever, right? But it, they couldn't even do that, it says. Okay. For three days. This is very significant, right? So it was like as if Jesus was in his grave for three days. For three days, the Egyptians were like dead. They were lying in their graves. So this was like a foreshadowing of the, the, the final plague, the 10th plague, where all the firstborn will die. God is saying, hey, look, this is how it feels to lie in your, in your graves, in your tombs. Okay, He gave them a taste of death. So what does this play teach us today or during Jesus' time? Jesus also struck the Israelites, the Jews who opposed him, with darkness. Okay. So let's go to John chapter 12, verse 40. So John chapter 12, verse 40 says, He has blinded their eyes. And he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them, right? So he blinded them so that they were dwelling in darkness, right? And then look at uh, verse 45 and verse 46. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as the light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness, right? So in Jesus' time in the New Testament era, Darkness has a spiritual meaning. If you believe in Jesus, you are in the light. If, you, if not, then you are in darkness. But now, after Jesus gave them so many chances, they didn't believe, right? So he struck them with darkness so that he ca they cannot repent and believe in Jesus. Only Jesus' disciples who believed him were now in the light. So just like there was light in Goshen, those who are with Christ have light. So remember in John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This was how the Jews were back then. And then the same thing is happening today. If you do not receive the word of Christ, then you're living in spiritual darkness. But those of us who, has, who have received this word, who have believed in Christ, who have received the spirit of God, are now dwelling in the light. We are in Goshen, in Christ. So we have to remain in Christ. That's the key here. And in Revelation chapter 16, verse 10, in the end times, it says that the God will strike the kingdom of the beast with darkness, right? So here in verse 10, it says, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain. Why is there pain if with darkness? Darkness doesn't cause pain, right? But this spiritual darkness does cause pain because it's the darkness of the heart and the soul. So it has pain. But what? look at verse 11. And yet they didn't repent. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. They had pain in their souls and they still refused to repent because they had darkness and God hardened their hearts. But on the other hand, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, this is what God says. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So, let us, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober, right? So we are in the light. So we need to be awake. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, 
in whose case the God of this world, that's the dragon, Satan, right? The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then verse 6 says, for, our, for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. See, this is what true light is. Light is the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ. Okay, that's what light is. Knowing Christ and knowing God through his word. That's light. If we don't have that, then we're living in darkness. Okay, so what causes this darkness in the end times? We need to know this, right? This is important. What causes this darkness? Revelation chapter 9 verse 2 says, He opened the bottomless pit and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. So God allows Satan to open the bottomless pit, the abyss, and smoke comes out. So in other words, basically, God's grace was holding this bottomless pit closed. But then when time comes, when judgment time comes, he lets Satan open it and smoke comes out. And what is this smoke? It is the smoke that darkens the sun and the air, right? Darkness is caused by this smoke that comes out of the bottomless pit. So what is this smoke? This smoke is human pride. Right? Pride, just like smoke, rises. And pride disables a person to breathe, meaning pray. Spiritual breathing is prayer. And it blocks the people from receiving God's word. The sun is the word of God, right? So human pride is the cause of this darkness. Okay. So we need to be humble at all times. That's God's desire for us. Let's look at Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Okay? Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. Because pride will bring about darkness. And Pharaoh was proud, right? He thought he was God. So he opposed the true God. That's what got him killed. Okay? And then finally, number 10, the plague of the death of the firstborn. Well, what's going on here? Plague of the death of the firstborn. Okay. So, in this plague, all the firstborn, from the firstborn of Pharaoh down to the firstborn of those people in the dungeons, in the jails, to all the firstborn of even the Egyptian livestock, even the animal firstborn died. Every firstborn in Egypt died. Okay. And only those families who had the blood of the lamb on their doorpost survived. Doorpost and lintel, right? Only if you had the blood of the lamb. Even if you were an Israelite living in Goshen, if you don't have the blood, your firstborn would die. You have to have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and lintel to survive. Okay. And another distinctive feature of this plague is that up to plagues one through nine were performed either by Aaron or Mo Moses. However, plague number 10 is God. God is the one who directly intervenes to perform this plague okay. so exodus chapter 12 oops. exodus chapter 12 verses 12 and 13 it says for i will go through right god saying i will go through the land of egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of egypt both man and beast 
and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. That's why this feast is called Passover. Because God passed over the houses with the blood. Okay. So this was God's judgment upon the gods of Egypt. But also this was a God taking vengeance upon Satan for deceiving Adam so that Adam would die, right? Adam was God's firstborn. And not only that, now this was God taking vengeance upon Pharaoh of Egypt for oppressing and persecuting the Israelites and killing the Israelites. Remember, Pharaoh had all the male babies thrown into the Nile River. And God says, Israel is my firstborn, right? Let's look at Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. See, Pharaoh killed God's firstborn, the Israelites. So God is taking vengeance upon him with the same way. Okay. So. Think about these two plagues, darkness and the plague of firstborn together, right? After three days of darkness, the firstborns died. After Jesus was in his grave for three days and he resurrected, through his resurrection, he put to death the firstborn of Satan. Okay? Jesus, through his resurrection, put to death the firstborn of Satan. Okay, So what is a firstborn? We have to know this. What is a firstborn? Let's look at Genesis chapter 49, uh, verse 3. So Genesis 49:3 says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. So when Jacob calls Reuben his firstborn, he describes him as my might and the beginning of my strength. So in the Bible, the definition of firstborn is the beginning of one's strength. The starting point, the foundation of his or her power or strength. That's their firstborn. So what is, so firstborn is the beginning of one's strength. So what is your firstborn? What's the foundation of your strength and power? We have to think about that. Also, what is Satan's firstborn? What is the beginning of his power? So the firstborn in the Bible is the one who will succeed the lineage, carry on the family name. Right? The firstborn then is the future of your family, future of the lineage. The future rests with the firstborn. That's what the ancient peoples believed. That's it was the beginning of their strength, and the firstborn was their future. Okay. So what is your firstborn right now? What are you entrusting your future upon? Okay. So back to Satan. What's his firstborn? Satan's firstborn is death. Death is the power that Satan uses that he wields over us human beings. Think about it. Death is like the ultimate thing, right? The, the biggest threat is I'm going to kill you, right? And death is Satan's strength. That is the beginning of his power. And as I said, after Jesus died on the cross and resurrected, after three days of him of darkness, of him being in the grave, he resurrected and he destroyed the firstborn of Satan. Okay. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14.
Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, he, meaning Jesus, might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. What did Jesus do? Through his death, he destroyed death. Right? Through the death of Jesus, he destroyed the one who had the power over, over death, which is the devil. Okay. Also, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. It says, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Death is, death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. So death is the beginning of their power. That's the last stronghold. So spiritually speaking, the firstborn is something that a person entrusts his future upon, right? So what is our firstborn today? If our firstborn is not God, if it's not Jesus Christ, then we are like Pharaoh. He is depending, he's trusting on something else as a, for his future. And this plague is teaching us that God will destroy all those things. If money is your firstborn and you're depending on money for your future, God's going to destroy that. That's going to become your death later on. If power is your future, your firstborn, God's going to destroy that too. So the only thing that will remain is the word of God, the Bible says, right? The word has to become our firstborn, that we put our trust upon. Our, our future must be founded upon the word of God and Jesus Christ. That's it. Nothing else. Otherwise, we, we could be like Pharaoh. Okay. So now let me conclude this message. What is the conclusion here? So what does the 10 plagues teach us? Well, the 10 plagues teach us uh, one very simple lesson. Okay, Especially in today, plagues number 7 through 10. Plagues number 7 through 10 show us God's judgment. And that judgment is expressed as God declaring war against his enemy. That's his judgment. So it shows us how, how God's going to judge in the end times, and he does it by declaring war against his enemy. Okay? So who is the enemy? In, the, in, in, the, in Exodus, it was Pharaoh, right, of Egypt. But in the end times, it is Satan, dragon, the Antichrist. And they are the God of this world. So the world is Egypt. The world is the enemy. So let's look at James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God, right? Hostility. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, right? If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God because the world is the enemy of God. So you know that verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 32? It says, um, I'm sorry. Oh, this is not the verse. You know that verse that says, if God is for us, who could be against us? I thought it was right here. Oh, here it is. Verse 31. So if God is for us, who is against us? Right? You know this verse, right? We've heard this verse before. Well, think about the opposite of that verse. If God is against us, who can save us? Nobody, right? If God is against us, if God becomes my enemy, 
then for that person, it's over, right? And that's what the 10 plagues here is showing to us. Pharaoh and Egypt became the enemy of God. So God, the, this, the 10 plague shows us how God attacks his enemy. And how does he do that? Satan attacks his enemy by trying to take, take away the physical things. Right? For example, how did Satan attack Job? He took away his children. Then he took away his wealth. Then he took away his health. That's how Satan attacks us. That's Satan's mode of warfare. But Job endured through all that. Okay? But God does it differently. How does God attack? The 10 plagues is teaching us that God attacks his enemy by attacking the heart and the soul and the mind. So that unclean spirits will come and deceive them. He will send locusts to take away their faith. He will send darkness to blind their hearts so that there is pain. And eventually, the result of all of that is that they will not be able to believe in God. Because God takes away their grace so they cannot be saved. And the unbelievers of this world may think, oh, that's nothing. I don't care about that, right? But that is the, the worst thing ever. That is the greatest defeat. Okay, But people of this world think, oh, I can't lose these things. But this is a more severe attack. This is how God judges in the end times. So think about that. If God is against us, nobody can save us. And friendship with the world makes us an enemy of God. That's what the 10 plagues are teaching us. So today, I hope and pray that we will take this lesson to heart and truly uh, come out of this world and become a friend of Christ and a friend of God. So that we could be protected as the Israelites were protected in Goshen, right? So let's look at Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 through 4, and then we'll end. Here it says, And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that you have given to us today through your Bible study. Father, help us to truly take this word to heart. And may we receive uh, this lesson with faith so that we could remember that the world is an enemy of God. And whoever befriends the world becomes an enemy of God. And we have seen how scary and fearful it is for those enemies of God. Father God, help us to always remain in your word and remain in Christ. May we become a friend of God like Abraham was so that we may be protected from the plagues that may come upon this world in the end times. May our hearts and our souls and our minds always be sealed with your word so that we may always have faith in you, Lord. And may that faith be what protects us in these end times. We thank you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Let's give glory to God with our applause. And let me stop the...